Hello, I'm Sean Reeves, and welcome to the video about how to value your business as a part of the Business Moreton Bay Region video series. I'm Sean Reeves, Director of SRJ Walker Wayland, business advisors, tax agents, accountants, auditors, and all other things business related. Welcome along today to the have a, uh, a listen to a discussion that I'm having with, with Tony Brown about how to value your business. Tony, perhaps you could tell the people a little bit about yourself too. Sure. Uh, I'm a director and founder of Divest Merge Acquire, which is a mergers and acquisitions transaction advisory. Sounds a lot, but basically we help people buy and sell businesses nationally and internationally uh, based in uh, Queensland. Great. So I guess uh, you do a fair bit of work on talking to people about valuing businesses. The core of our business is helping baby boomers retire and we're helping others acquire businesses, uh, buy themselves in for various reasons. Okay, fantastic. So yeah. it's great to have an expert with us today. So Tony, to set a scene, I'm having a, a discussion with you about my business. Yeah. And I've said I wouldn't mind getting a valuation why would I want evaluation for my business? What are the situations where evaluation is going to be relevant? Well, any business owner, from my perspective, should get evaluation, even informally done with their accountants every year, because a lot of people we come across have been working in their businesses for up to 30 years, and they're thinking, maybe I don't want to do this anymore, and have no idea of what their businesses are worth. And it's a very useful thing to have a, a sort of a ballpark understanding of what your business would be worth every year after you get your accounts done for a start. Now okay. I mentioned, so that's a, a good reason. There could be a lot of other reasons like um, uh, retirement, there could be a change of partners, somebody could want to exit, somebody might want to buy in, but there's a whole lot of reasons. Um, um, just simple business restructuring can sometimes require evaluation to be done for the tax office. Okay, and for, for the Office of State Revenue, for example, for, for stamp duty reasons as well. Exactly. All of those, all of those um, uh, government and administrative bodies looking to make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing when, when transactions are happening. Yeah. But it's also a significant asset to the business owner. Sure. And they should know, like every other thing, you know what your properties are roughly worth. Businesses are exactly the same. They're a significant asset and it's useful to know what they're worth at any point in time. Okay, and I guess it's also important to, for example, for insurance purposes, if, if you're saying, well, I've, I've built a significant asset, but at the moment a lot of it relies on me, what happens if something happens to me? Mm. What does it mean for my family? So I guess you need to know in order to be able to insure properly as well. That's exactly right, Sean. Um, most of our business is helping people sell or buy, but the, all the other reasons you're talking about are reasons why people would get in many cases what we'd call a formal valuation as opposed to an, an informal valuation. Okay, so you're talking about a formal valuation, which is a lovely segue into what was going to be my next question. Yep. Where do I start? Do I go straight to a registered valuer or is there other work to be done or other people to speak to? What's the starting point in getting a valuation done? So a formal valuation should be done by a registered business valuer. Uh, they sometimes have the same qualification as a property valuer, but usually they don't. It's a special skill. You're, you're valuing uh, different things as opposed to tangible assets. You're valuing the cash flow and the profit of the business. We can cover that in how to value a business, yeah. but definitely you need to go to someone who's, who's got some credibility or qualifications in that area. Okay, okay. So if, if I'm going to approach someone to do that, uh, what information are they going to need from me? They're certainly going to need financial statements, minimum of the last three years. Um, so it's always helpful to have your accounts in a good, a good state and to have timely accounts pre prepared. Um, also, the assets of the business are, are important, the tangible assets, as in the plant and equipment, uh, stock and other things. So it is very handy to keep good quality financial records um, and obviously the minimum anchor point is annual accounts. Some businesses are well geared up to do monthly accounts and, and management reporting which adds another level of, um, of checking and, and, and 
capability, particularly if um, one of the reasons you were selling, uh, it was you were valuing, was to sell, because you do need those interim reports as well. Okay. Okay. So um, I know uh, that you're mentioning financial statements, and from a tax accounting point of view. Mm. I know that when uh, accounts are collated, quite often they're collated for tax purposes and where we've got instant asset write-offs or pooled assets, we don't have very good asset list or depreciation schedules. Yeah. So is it as easy as three years worth of financials or is there a lot more that's got to happen around that? The sort of checklist that we have to produce even an informal valuation runs to quite a large number of items. Okay. So you, you know that we do need to uh, understand the financials and then adjust them for uh, factors that are uh, not likely to continue. Uh, so there's yeah, there's a lot of information, a uh, whole lot of questions that someone doing the job properly would be asking the business owners. Okay. In re in respect to the information that we've got to put together, is it is it all financial? People um, will, in a trend, in evaluation, it's primarily financial. But there are other factors like the quality of the lease that might be in place if it's a location sensitive business, the customer concentration. You can imagine a business that has one customer is potentially a lot riskier for some for anybody yes. involved in the business than someone that has a hundred or a large great. You know, with the, if the largest customer was one percent of turnover of sales, that's a far safer business and more resilient. There's a whole lot of things like whether you have customers that are contracted, whether you have a strong supplier chain, uh, distribution channels, there's many, many factors that affect how people would assess a business. Okay, so I'm getting a sense there that the two of our main value drivers, and we might be able to break these down a bit further, are risk and return. Right, so we've talked about return, that's the financial stuff. You've started talking about risk, which is, which is really interesting. Is it easy to measure risk in a business? It depends on who you are. Um, if you were looking to sell a business, then a buyer who's come from your industry um, and who understands what you're doing um, and has already expertise in that area would see that risk as much lower if they can assess your business better than somebody who is completely outside that business. And the further you get outside of your knowledge, your history and your knowledge and your area of expertise, the risk factors go up exponentially, both yeah, sides yeah. of that, either okay. way. Okay. So, so it depends on who's assessing the business. When we're selling a business, we look and say, the people that are gonna pay the most, in other words, it's worth the most to, are the people with the most to gain and the least to risk. And it's usually people already doing what you're doing and it's all, and they also understand it. So they've got, and they've got more to bring to the business, and more opportunity they see in the business. So, risk and return are, are in the eyes of the assessor, of the person who's, who's, perhaps going to um, be involved with a transaction with that business. Okay. So, so you know, the buyer is a really important concept, which yep. we'll we'll get to in another video about. Yes how to sell your business. Yeah. But for the moment, we'll, we'll stick here with what we've got on the, on the financial uh, uh, and, and non-financial value drivers. How, how is the financial return for my business calculated? Um, we, we use this term normalising profits. Yeah. Perhaps you can explain to our audience what normalising profits actually means. Yep. So normalised Profits are the result of taking the actual profit reported and adjusting it for anything that won't affect the new or the business going forward, either a new owner or the current owner in new circumstances. So we're adjusting for some unusual things, extraordinary items, um, abnormal items, um, for example an extreme bad debt or a fire or something that took the business out of action for three months, you wouldn't expect the business then to be, if you took that historic set of profits, you wouldn't expect that to be repeated going forward, for example. So we're looking at saying we're predicting the future maintainable profit of the business, future maintainable earnings, using the current and recent past performance and the trends as a guide. Okay, so that's an important concept, isn't it? Future maintainable earnings, yeah. and we'll, we'll get into a few buzz phrases here because us, 
our financial and business advisors love buzz phrases. FME, we call yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, so we're uh, we're talking about future maintainable earnings. So, future means we've got to try and look into a crystal ball and predict what's going to happen. Yep. So what you're saying there is that the best way to do that is have a look at recent past mm. and adjust for those things that aren't necessarily relevant for the future. Mm. Maintainable means we've got a confidence that it's not certain, but fairly predictable that that's where we're going to be. Yep. And earnings uh, is about the return you're getting from the business. Mm. Now, another little acronym, uh, a cool phrase is EBITDA. Mm -hmm. So we use EBITDA to calculate or to normalize and then calculate future maintainable earnings. Yeah. Perhaps you can enlighten us on what EBITDA is and, and, <laughs> and why we do it that way. And knowing that you already know, but we're <laughs> going to share with our audience because yeah. EBIT, we'll start with EBIT and we'll go to EBITDA. EBIT is earnings, which is a, a form of profit. Yeah. And as an accountant, we can say whatever you want the profit to be, but earnings is the piece that falls on the bottom line, but the important point that you're getting to is we have to define which profit it is. Yes. And it's the earnings before EB, interest, which is all finance costs as though the business assets were debt free, um, and tax. So because the tax regime of the business might be entirely different from each one business to another. Okay. So by going to EBIT is ultimately where we are, that's after tax. Now, EBITDA is, before, is earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortisation. Yeah. So you really don't have to worry about amortisation. It's like depreciation, but except it's of intangible assets sure. like leases. So EBITDA is before interest tax depreciation. Now, the reason why people would add back depreciation and make it, to come up with a profit before depreciation would be because depreciation is a non-cash item. So okay. the true cash flow okay. of the business before paying for de depreciating assets, which is a non-cash item, is EBITDA. Okay. Now, so, so we're trying to capture the earnings from the business before the interest tax depreciation because we want to see what the cash earnings of the business are in order to assess the return that that business is going to provide us yeah and then we can build in our own financing costs, I'm imagining. It depends, and it also depends on the type of business. Um, EBIT is actually the ultimately the truest form of um, assessment, but we don't just take the depreciation. This is where it gets no. a little bit more complicated. We'll add back the actual accounting, non-cash depreciation, and we'll replace it with a real depreciation called a provision for cap replacement, or capital okay. replacement. Now, let's say you had a car rental business, and you have two, Probably two costs. One is some labour, but the biggest cost you've got in that business is depreciation on sure, the vehicles. Sure. So if you just took EBITDA in that particular kind of business, you wouldn't be really showing the true performance because you have Understand. to keep buying new assets and they depreciate. So the capital replacement to come up with EBIT ultimately is a more generic measure across all businesses. Okay, okay. So I'm guessing we're saying here, and sorry about two accountants talking with each other, getting into, uh, getting into some, some nitty gritty, but suffice to say, um, businesses are really the same when it comes to, to calculating the normalised profits, and it does pay to get a little bit of direction around where that's at. But at least we've given people a bit of an idea about how to calculate that return. But the one thing we talked about was it starts with profit. Yes. And the key driver of the value of a business is its cash flow slash profit. Okay. That's really everything. Else. We just talked about the different variations of how you measure it, but it all comes down to the profit, first of all, which is the return the business will generate. Okay. So let's talk about risk then. Yep. How does risk come into the equation? Okay. So the lowest risk kind of assets or investments might be money, Probably not very high return, but in the bank. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about point low zero risk. zero zero something of a percent yes, at the moment. Very yeah. low risk yeah. and very low return. Yes. At the other end of the spectrum is going to be probably an active working business where the business has a high amount of 
um, variable or, or vari volatility due to the influence of the owners, the customers, and many things that are inside and outside the owner's control. Sure. So the higher the risk, the higher the return people expect. So somewhere in there is property, that's a low, fairly low risk, lower return asset. Um, and you'll see that businesses are generally on this, at the end where you're wanting a, a, a much more solid return because it's what we call an active asset versus a passive asset. Okay, okay. So I guess then what I'm looking at is if I'm looking at a business in nice round numbers that has a, an EBITDA mm -hmm. or normalised of a million dollars. Yep and I'm looking for a return on my investment if I'm going to invest in that business of say 25%, hmm. because that's how I've assessed the risk. Pre-tax. Pre-tax. Yeah. What does that do for what I'm prepared to pay for the business? A million dollars, I'm looking for a 25% return. Okay, well clearly you could afford to invest four million, which is a 25% return of four million is one million. Okay. So you basically you look and say, what's the profit of the business? Okay, it's a million dollars, divide by 0.25 or 25%, which is the same as multiplying by four. So that's an EBIT multiplier, which is the same thing as the reciprocal of the rate of return, excuse okay. the puns, but yep. the multiple of four would give you a 25% return. So okay. you can and afford to invest four million dollars. And I, so ironically, the uh, lower the return that I'm going to expect to get from this business, the higher the multiple. And I think that... Yes, that the more you'll does, pay for the business. That does confuse people a few <laughs> times. Well, hang on, my, my capitalisation rate, which is the, the yep. rate of return you're looking for, comes down, but the multiple goes up, I don't get that. That just means that if you have a look at that equation, mm. it's the flip side. So a 33% return is a three times multiple. A 50% return is a two times multiple. Yes. So the more return you're looking to to um, the higher the percentage of return you're looking to generate from the business, the lower the price you're prepared to pay for it. And it's exactly it the same of the for risk a property. Factors. Yeah, okay. If, someone wants an eight, if someone's happy with an 8% return on the property, the multiple will be roughly 12. Okay, are there any rules of thumb that we can use or is that a, a bit of a danger? Um, look, rules of thumb, ROT, generally considered Rot. <laughs> take take it carefully. Acronym. Th there okay. are some there are some rules that apply in you know, relevant to industries, but when it sure. all boils down to it, the only general rule would be probably between three and four times EBIT. Okay. That's the only safe one you can apply. Most businesses are worth that kind of range, unless it's Telstra or something quite large. Yeah. Uh, unless it's a large takeover yeah. or, or a company in a very special position, either with yeah. very low risk or yeah. very high risk. Some businesses sell on a multiple of turnover. But when, it, when you do reduce it back, the prof, it generally becomes a roughly three to five times EBIT multiple. Okay, so I've gone through this process and I've, and I've sought some advice and I've come up with my $4 million amount for my business. Yeah. Is that a lock-in? If I turn up, am I going to insist somebody pays $4 million or is it trickier than that as far as the market's concerned? Yeah, there's many, many things. Every business is different. And that's why it's always hard for a valuer to try and get precedence like they do with commercial properties, for example, because there could, it could be that customer concentration we're talking about, the stability of the staff, the dependence of the business on the owners, and the more dependence you imagine the business is on the owners who may want to leave, then the riskier it is for someone else coming in. Okay, so it's a function of perception of, you know, of risk on the part of the, the buyer and what they perceive at risk may perceive as risk may affect what they're prepared to pay for the business so we're really talking a willing but not anxious seller mm. and a willing but not anxious buyer and where they meet as far as negotiation goes my four million dollars is not necessarily a lock-in no not necessarily you can't okay. take it you can't just say every business is going to be going to get you that okay for sure just one little last question before we close there is a lot happening at the moment around angel investment and startups. Mm. Do we value those the same way as we value other businesses? You certainly don't. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine we just talked about um, businesses valued on their cash flow, yeah. historic and projected cash flow. And you get, if you look and say, businesses are, are within a spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum, there's a business based on its cash flow. Uh, with not much intellectual property or IP as we would call it. Um, 
and then at the other end of the spectrum of a business that hasn't started, it could just be an idea or a concept. Mm, mm. And, and at that end of the spectrum, there's no cash flow, there's no historic earnings. So most businesses are actually somewhere in that spectrum. Uh, most businesses have intellectual property, but if, if there's a business or a, uh, that's just starting out and it's only in its prototype stages or it's one or two years out, you can't possibly rely on historic earnings. So you okay. have to forecast try and come up with some method or a way of credibly projecting what you think the possibilities will be. Obviously there's higher risk, so people are going to want a higher return. So yeah. they won't pay the same multiples that they would on historic re returns. So what we're doing is we're getting back to that crystal ball again in, in a much bigger way. Yep. And we're saying, um, I haven't got the financials here to show you, but I'm going to show you what I think it'll look like. And then I guess it's up to the buyer to see how much they buy in to the story as yep. opposed to actually physically buying into the business and there's a lot of of perception and emotion involved in that investment decision as opposed to cold hard financials and just as we talked about the knowledge of the buyers the more they understand that industry and have more confidence with it and understand the possibilities of this startup then the more likely they will come up with a valuation and therefore more likely to proceed so if you are looking for an investor and your capital, you want somebody who knows who and who can bring more to the table than just money, mm, who can mm. actually bring expertise to help grow that business. Okay. Tony, thanks for that. I know we've been through a little bit of technical stuff, but hopefully we've given the audience a, a, a really good idea of what we've got to go through to collate information, to, to normalise that, to assess risk, to put what we hope is a value guide on a business and then have that value guide to use to, to sell a business, to refinance it, to, yeah. uh, to have a look at what it's worth for us in retirement. So look, I hope you've, you've had some, some benefit out of this. Uh, thank, thank you again, Tony. You're welcome. Uh, Tony, you'll be joining me for selling a business. Um, please look out for that video as well. This valuing a business is a subset of the selling. Um, we look forward to catching you if you decide to take valuing further and, and have a look at the sale process. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks a lot.